Okay, good afternoon, um, everybody, and welcome to this uh, ACNET uh, webinar. Um, there are currently uh, 59 um, attendees that have joined the webinar, and my name is Francesco Emma, and I'm speaking from my office in Rome. So I think that most of you are now familiar with how the webinar works, but uh, just let me remind you that your microphone are turned off, so you cannot ask questions by a microphone, but after the webinar, you can send your question through the application that is present on your screen, on your right hand side of the screen. And, um, and I will ask for you your question at the end of the presentations. And, and there will also be a poll that will be um, sent out um, after the presentation. Actually, there are four questions that will be sent out. So the webinar will last approximately 30 minutes and we will have roughly 15 minutes for questions. Uh, should we not have enough time, additional questions will be forward, forwarded directly by email to our speaker, which is today Max uh, Libo from Colon. So Max Libo uh, combines his clinical experience as a broad certified pediatric nephrologist and he has a training in cellular and molecular biology. His group follows a translational approach to study genetic kidney disease with a special focus on polycystic kidney disease as a model of ciliopathies. His lab currently works on molecular mechanism affecting cellular signaling in ARPKD and other congenital um, abnormalities of the kidney and the urinary tract. He has also established the International Collaborative clinical registry studies on polycystic kidney disease in childhood. Um, Dr. Libo has published more than 60 scientific articles. He is the recipient of several national and international honors and awards, and that includes the Adalbert Czerny Award, which is the highest scientific award in German pediatrics. Um, Dr. Libo is currently the head of experimental pediatric nephrology and the head of the interdisciplinary center for chronically ill children at the University Hospital in Cologne. And he's also a co-PI at the Center for Molecular Medicine in Cologne and the speaker of the working group on ciliopathy and CACUD of uh, the European ERCNET Initiative. So the title of his presentation today is a primer um, to cystic kidney disease and ciliopathies. So Max, it's up to you. Thank you, Francesco, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, give this webinar here today, which is on uh, cystic kidney diseases and, and ciliopathies. Um, and um, yeah, I was asked to put a picture of myself uh, on one of the first uh, slides. Um, and um, I'm speaking from uh, Cologne here, uh, where I'm a pe trained pediatric nephrologist. Um, and um, you've heard that I'm involved in the working group CACUD and ciliopathies in in ERCnet. So um, today we want to talk about cystic kidneys and what is a cyst in a kidney. So a cyst is a fluid-filled cavity um, that is lined with uh, epithelia. Um, and when we talk about cystic kidneys, it's important to um, differentiate between a kidney cyst uh, and a cystic kidney. Kidney cyst is something that is very common in adult patients. So our colleagues from adult nephrology uh, will confirm that um, this is something that they commonly see, a single cyst or two or so, um, whereas a cystic kidney um, is a kidney in which cysts um, replace the normal renal parenchyma, and that leads to um, deterioration of kidney function. So the two probably most important forms of um, polycystic kidney diseases are the autosomal dominant and the autosomal recessive form of polycystic kidney disease, ADPKD and ARPKD. So ADPKD is a disorder that starts in childhood but clinically becomes um, prominent in adults. It is characterized by these macrocysts um, that you can see here or in this ultrasound picture or in the MRI. 
Um, and in addition to this cystic uh, replacement of normal parenchyma, there is um, fibrosis uh, in the kidney. Differing um, from ADPKD is ARPKD, which typically is a disease of early onset childhood, of early childhood, um, and this is characterized by these microcysts that um, can be found throughout the kidney. They derive from the collecting duct, um, and you can see that they are all over the place, uh, leading to massive renal enlargement. You can see that every now and then there is a micro macrocyst um, in the kidney, um, but the typical finding in ARPKD are these very small cysts everywhere, as seen here uh, in the MRI picture. So when we compare these two um, types of polycystic kidney diseases, these are genetic disorders, and uh, the main diseases that are affected are PKHD1 in ARPKD, um, which accounts for about 85 to 90 percent um, of the patients. And then um, recently, Carsten Bergman's group uh, described that mutations in ZIP1L can also lead to an ARPKD phenotype. For autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, um, there are two main genes that are affected. They're called PKD1 and PKD2. Um, and PKD1 accounts for 85% um, uh, of the cases, and PKD2 for roughly 15% of the cases. And then there are rare, um, uh, more rarely mutations in GANAP and um, uh, NAP uh, JB11 have been found. As an autosomal recessive disease, um, ARPKD is a very rare disease. Um, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease um, is actually more common and is one of the most common causes uh, of end-stage renal diseases in adults. When we look at the clinical manifestations, there's obviously chronic kidney disease in both of them, um, arterial hypertension, which uh, in ARPKD may be very, very pronounced, um, and sometimes we need uh, various groups of uh, classes to treat this arterial hypertension. And then there are um, also extra renal manifestations that I will come to in a second. As a recessive disease, the risk for siblings is 25% in ARPKD and 50% in ADPKD um, as a dominant disorders. There are these cases of uh, spontaneous mutations uh, in ADPKD and in such a situation Obviously, the risk for a sibling um, is very, very low. Important uh, when we talk to, to the families is the risk for the own uh, children, which is very low in ARPKD as a recessive disease, and about 50% um, for the dominant form of polycystic uh, kidney disease. It, when we try to differentiate between the uh, two disorders, it may be helpful to look also at the, the kidneys of the parents. Um, again, no alterations in the recessive disorder, and usually uh, the family will tell you which uh, one of the parents is affected in ADPKD. And then when we look at the prognosis of these two disorders, um, ARPKD still is a very severe disease of early childhood. Um, about 50% of the patients reach end-stage renal disease in the first two decades of life. Um, and maybe even more important for the first um, weeks of life is that there is still substantial mortality uh, in patients with uh, neonatal respiratory distress due to pulmonary hypoplasia, which may be a consequence of um, renal impairment um, before birth and the following oligohydramnios. In ARPKD, there's also um, involvement of the liver as congenital hepatic fibrosis, um, and severe complications due to the following portal hypertension um, may come from this. In ADPKD, um, the mean age, the median age of end-stage renal disease depends on the underlying um, mutation. Um, it is earlier in PKD1 mutations than in PKD2 mutations, especially 
in truncating PKD1 mutations, it is earlier and more severe. In addition to the, the two that we have just talked about, there is um, another very important disorder that is called nephronophthesis. Um, it is the most common genetic cause of end-stage renal disease in the first three decades of life. It is actually a disorder that can be caused by multiple uh, mutations in multiple genes. So currently there are more than 25 genes, uh, mutations in which lead to nephronophthesis. And it typically uh, presents uh, during school age um, with polyuria or an accidental finding uh, of GFR loss or rise in uh, creatinine. If you look at the ultrasound, the typical picture is um, the picture of a kidney that is normal sized or small. There is um, very poor differentiation between cortex and medulla. And there are these um, few cysts that typically can be found between the cortex uh, and the renal medulla at the corticomedullary border. Usually this is now a, um, a disorder that is diagnosed um, by the clinical exp um, presentation and, and genetics, but um, if you did biopsy this, uh, these kids as previously done, um, then you would find this um, interstitial inflammation and these changes in the uh, basement membranes. Nephronophthesis may occur as an isolated uh, disorder, but it may also be part of a, uh, a larger syndrome. Um, and we've listed some of them here in this, um, in this list, um, including a senior Loken syndrome, in which nephronophthesis presents with retinitis pigmentosa, or Joubert syndrome, which is characterized by cerebellar vermis hypoplasia uh, and ataxia. And the complex of nephronophthesis and Joubert then goes on to uh, the very severe Meckel-Gruber uh, syndrome. And actually there is phenotypic and ge um, genetic overlap uh, in these disorders. Also another um, syndrome that is uh, important in this context is Bartle-Beadle syndrome, uh, which is characterized by a cystic kidney disease that may uh, in adults uh, resemble uh, nephronophthesis. Um, and shows characteristic extrarenal manifestations. And then finally, in addition to the PKDs that we've talked about, nephronophthesis, um, there's one huge group that has um, come up over the last years, which is HNF1 beta associated disease. And um, this HNF1 beta is a transcription factor, and actually, um, uh, this is a disorder that can uh, present with variable uh, uh, kidney manifestation. This includes renal cysts, um, but it may also show up uh, with signs of Kakut. Extra renal manifestations include um, hypomagnesemia and early onset uh, diabetes mellitus. So, and from the picture that you've, you've seen and um, from what I've told you, uh, you may have already um, uh, uh, seen that there may now be, or that there's this concept uh, coming up of phenocopies. So we have the classical um, polycystic kidney disease um, with the classical genes at the center um, of, uh, of this drawing by Carsten Bergman, but there may be other um, disorders um, that show overlapping phenotypes, including especially HNF1 beta related disorders, but also some um, nephronophthesis types or other uh, ciliopathies, or obviously some um, un unidentified disease genes that we um, are currently looking for. So, if available, genetics may be helpful uh, to finally pin down uh, the molecular cause. Uh, of the disease, which may be uh, needed uh, to, to look for um, extrarenal manifestations, or it may be helpful to specifically look for extrarenal manifestations. However, genetics is not always available, and um, sometimes um, it may also take some time to get the diagnosis. So, what are helpful clinical criteria, um, you know, that will allow us to to get an early clinical diagnosis. And this is um, basically just based on some, on, a, on very few facts that can easily be obtained with ultrasound. 
family history um, and just looking at kidney function. And um, in the next minutes, I would like to go through um, these six questions um, that may guide the way to the right diagnosis. So first question is about family history. <clears throat> Uh, we've talked about ARPKD as a recessive disorder, and the same is true for nephronothesis, um, the NPH-associated syndromes, or bardet beetle uh, syndrome. So there's typically no prominent family history of cystic kidney diseases. It may, however, be worth asking for a consanguinity um, in uh, these patients, as obviously recessive disorders are more common um, in consanguineous parents. ADPKD and HNF1 beta show a dominant pattern of inheritance. However, you should be aware um, that spontaneous uh, mutations can occur in about 10 or even more, up to 25% uh, of ADPKD um, cases, um, and are quite common in HNF1 beta associated cases. So, a negative family history does not completely rule out um, ADPKD, but makes it less likely. The second question is about the age of presentation. <clears throat> ARPKD is a disease of early childhood, as I said. Um, in the classical form, uh, there is uh, antenatal onset, um, whereas nephronophthesis, for example, um, is more commonly found in its juvenile form. Um, and these are kids in uh, young school age. ADPKD is a disease that starts in childhood with simple, uh, single cysts or maybe multiple cysts, but it doesn't lead to um, deterioration in kidney function in childhood in its typical uh, ways. Two, two to five percent of ADPKD um, patients show very early onset um, uh, disease, but you know, 95% don't. Um, so ADPKD is a disease that over time develops, and uh, kidney function um, is usually impaired in adulthood. The number of cysts may be helpful. So for patients with positive family history of ADPKD, there are established criteria uh, that define um, age-dependent numbers of cysts to establish uh, the diagnosis of ADPKD. Um, and these criteria in the classical standard ultrasound are two cysts below the age of 30 years of age, uh, uni or bilateral, uh, two or more cysts per kidney in the age of 30 to 60, and over four cysts um, over the age of 60. With high-resolution ultrasound or with MRI, um, there are actually modified um, criteria that need to be um, checked. This is just true for patients with positive family uh, history of ADPKD. For other cystic kidney disorders, such criteria have not been established. And um, this is what you can see in here, you know, in ADPKD, you, this is from the adult uh, picture, you have these plenty, plenty of these cysts in NPH. Um, actually, there are some cysts, but um, very often uh, the number of cysts uh, is lower in NPH than in ADPKD. What about kids? I said that ADPKD starts in childhood um, and therefore a renal cyst in a kid um, is something that um, requires a good, good work up, um, especially asking about family history, etc. So don't just rely on, um, on the idea that this would be a normal, um, uncomplicated single cyst, but always consider a cystic kidney disease um, in any kid with a, uh, a renal cyst. Then it's about localization of cysts. So are they unilateral or are they bilateral? Um, there's always a chance that um, you have a presentation of a multicystic dysplastic kidney disease uh, in a kid if this is just unilateral. Um, and then where are these cysts found? 
I've mentioned already that for NPH, there's this classical localization at the border between uh, the cortex and the medulla, and that may help you to get, um, find your way to the diagnosis. Another aspect that is easily um, that can easily be um, addressed is the size of the kidney and of the cysts. ARPKD and ADPKD during its course um, show enlarged kidneys. However, the kidneys in juvenile and adolescent nephronothesis are normal sized or small. And we've already talked about the differences in the cyst size uh, between ADPKD and ARPKD. In ADPKD, you have these macrocysts, whereas in ARPKD, in classical forms, um, cysts are small. Finally, as the sixth point, um, extra renal symptoms. This can be crucial for establishing the clinical diagnosis. And um, I've listed some of the examples in here. So it's polycystic liver disease in ADPKD, um, hepatic fibrosis in ARPKD, hexadactyly in uh, Bardet Beetle syndrome, um, molar tooth sign in Joubert's, or retinitis pigmentosa or situs inversus in NPH associated um, diseases. So I've brought some of the examples um, with me. So here, a patient of ours with hexadactyly. Um, then this is the typical uh, molar tooth sign of um, a patient with uh, Joubert syndrome um, that is created by the uh, cerebellar vermis aplasia and uh, the changes of the, the midbrain. Then there is retinitis uh, pigmentosa. Um, and then of a patient of ours, this is the situs inversus uh, of a patient uh, with NPH. From the ARPKD, um, this is an ARPKD patient, and you see the dilated uh, bile ducts as part um, of the Crowley syndrome in ARPKD. So from this, I want to make the point that cystic kidney diseases are systemic disorders, and that it is absolutely worth to actively look for extrarenal symptoms. And why is that? And this is because um, cystic kidney diseases are currently thought to be um, ciliopathies. So the ciliary hypothesis by, by Greg Pazur that was um, uh, first published here 15 years ago um, states that um, cilia on cells um, regulate intracellular signaling pathways that when disturbed uh, result in cystic kidney diseases. So what are cilia? Um, cilia are these small uh, antenna-like structures on uh, the surface of the cell. Um, this is in cell culture. Um, and this is an EM picture of the tubule of a rat. And you can actually see these hair-like structures protruding into the tubule uh, of the kidney. This is a single uh, cilium. So the link between um, cilia and uh, cystic kidney diseases uh, was established when Maureen Barr found that uh, the PKD1 protein in the warm C. elegans um, actually localized uh, to cilia and that it was required for sensing uh, the environment. Just one year later, Greg Pazur published this uh, article and he um, found the mutation in the underlying gene or the underlying mutation in the gene um, of a mouse model of ARPKD um, and could show that the uh, corresponding protein was required for the assembly of cilia. And this was highly conserved um, as uh, the same protein in chlamydomonas uh, was required for the assembly of flagella. So, and then over the last um, 20 years or so, various groups um, have contributed and have found that the proteins that are affected in uh, the different forms of cystic kidney diseases actually um, form protein complexes at the cilium, can be found in joint complexes at the cilium uh, or at the ciliary base. And uh, the proteins leading to the same phenotypes uh, can be found in, in joint complexes. So there's 
the so-called BB zone uh, complex, so the different uh, proteins affected in uh, Bartlett Beetle syndrome, and um, the PKD proteins, uh, colloquialized, etc. Cilia exist in various forms, but um, we are now talking about the monocilia, and these can be found uh, on almost every type uh, of epithelial cell in the human body. So what do these cilia do? What are they good for? There are two main um, hypotheses that I want to talk about today. One um, is the idea that cilia could act as a flow sensor, as a sensor of mechano uh, uh, translation uh, to the cell, and that bending the cilium would lead to intracellular signaling cascades that then tell the cell where up and down and proximal and distal is. Uh, and you can imagine that for a tubular cell with a directed transport, this is an important information. Indeed, um, the group of Brad Yoder um, could show a few years ago that cilia can move in vivo. So they use dual photon uh, microscopy uh, in this mouse model. And what we have here is that we look into a living, um, uh, in the, into the kidney of a living mouse and they uh, mark the cilia with a fluorescent protein. And you can see that in this living kidney, um, these cilia do, do actually move in the tubular lumen. A second concept states that there may be receptors at the cilium um, that are specific and that um, activation of um, ciliary signaling uh, leads to very well controlled signaling uh, into the cell. And this has been shown, for example, for sonic hedgehog signaling and other signaling pathways. Actually, this, this work has been very important and multiple groups in the PKD field have contributed uh, to our understanding um, of ciliary signaling and, and PKD associated signaling. Um, this is just meant to give some, some idea how complex this uh, signaling is. And it also shows that um, the, this work, this basic science work, um, has led to the identification of multiple um, sites where we can potentially interfere um, with partly well-known drugs like metformin, for example. Um, the most prominent example that this has led to is uh, obviously tolvaptan. Um, tolvaptan um, has been shown to be um, uh, reducing the um, growth of total kidney volume in ADPKD. Um, so here you have the blue group that was treated with tovaptan, and you can see that the change in total kidney volume as a surrogate marker of um, progression of ADPKD rises much faster in the placebo control group. Um, concerning kidney function, it has also been shown that tovaptan reduces the loss uh, of kidney function in ADPKD um, patients. And this is work by Vicente Torres um, and colleagues. So to come to an end for us as pediatricians, um, these the um, defining clinical endpoints uh, for such studies uh, is a challenge because on the one hand, um, the clinical presentation can be quite variable and then we have uh, small subgroups um, of patients for each disease. So we therefore, together with Franz Schäfer um, uh, and the ESCAPE consortium and the German Pediatric Nephrology Association, um, set up a registry study uh, for ARPKD some years ago um, that collects the cause of um, uh, ARPKD patients over time with the basic um, information uh, questionnaire and then yearly follow-ups. And we have by now um, collected data on more than 500 um, patients, making this the biggest cohort um, so far. More recently, um, we thought about, okay, what, what about the children with ADPKD? And we don't really know whether it's good to treat them or when to treat them and what to look for. So together with Jalila Mekali uh, from Leuven, we have set up this ADPETKD 
uh, registry study um, that really took off um, at the beginning of this year. And actually by now we have more than 200 patients that have been um, included into AD PET KD. And obviously both of them are, are uh, of these registries are, are web based and you can attend the web pages and uh, get in touch with us if you're interested. AREG PKD, um, I want to focus focus on this at, uh, as it has been going on for a bit longer. Currently, um, there are 111 uh, centers in 27 countries that have registered for AUH PKD. About half of them actively uh, contribute uh, with patients. And um, one of the things that we looked at um, uh, over the last years was the question whether there are risk factors for early dialysis dependency um, in ARPKD. I guess you all know that um, for these families, when they are being diagnosed with um, ARPKD during pregnancy or the fetus is diagnosed, um, then the early dialysis dependency uh, may be an important um, factor for the family's uh, decision how to go on. So back then we had 420 patients uh, included. Um, some had to be um, excluded because um, of exclusion criteria. Some uh, didn't have uh, documented visits after birth. So we ended up with data on 385 um, uh, patients. And out of these um, 385, 36 uh, required uh, dialysis in the first year of life. And I don't want to go through all these characteristics with you. Um, but in this um, univariate uh, analysis, um, there are some uh, things coming up that you would expect. So, you know, oligohydramnios uh, or anhydramnios was more commonly seen uh, in patients that did require uh, dialysis in the first year of life. Um, we had more of these patients with um, enlarged kidneys. Um, and some things were, were really surprising and, and new to us. For example, um, uh, we could show that the APGAR um, in these uh, patients usually uh, was lower or was significantly lower in the dialysis uh, cohort. We then took it to a multivariate uh, uh, model um, and this confirmed that oligohydramnios and prenatally enlarged kidneys um, were independent risk factors um, for dialysis uh, or renal replacement therapy within the first year of life. Actually, it was dialysis in the first year of life. And then we ask ourselves, okay, is there a way that we can uh, predict this probability for dialysis um, within the first uh, 12 months? Um, is there an easy way to predict um, that we can quickly uh, tell uh, parents something? And uh, what we looked at um, is at the end, we could, we could find that enlarged kidneys, renal cysts, and oligoanhydramnios are good markers that can help us to differentiate. So I wanna quickly guide you, guide you through this. Um, in patients that uh, prenatally showed enlarged kidneys but no renal cysts and no oligoanhydramnios, the probability of dialysis within the first 12 months uh, after birth um, was 3.3%. Almost the same for renal cysts. Um, if you combine these two, it went up to 7%. Oligoanhydramnios was a strong marker with itself almost 9%. And then if you add these others, um, they add on to the likelihood. And if you have all three of them, so oligoanhydramnios and large kidneys and renal cysts prenatally, you end up with a probability of dialysis um, in the first year of life of about a third of the patients. However, this also means that two-thirds of these patients did not require dialysis in our registry um, cohort. And obviously this is a, is a registry study, a cohort study, um, so there are uh, technical uh, limitations to this. So I want to quickly summarize this um, talk. 
cystic kidney diseases are important causes for end-stage renal disease, both in children and adults. Um, we've looked at the various, uh, or at some of the um, important subtypes of cystic kidney diseases. Um, I didn't go into the rare um, uh, additional syndromes um, that uh, exist and that include um, cystic kidney diseases. Um, genetic testing may be required to confirm a specific diagnosis, but widely available uh, markers can help to um, rapidly establish a clinical diagnosis, um, and it may be helpful to um, actively look for extrarenal manifestations. Cystic kidneys. Uh, cystic kidney diseases are currently uh, considered to be seriopathies, and as such, they are systemic disorders. And for us as pediatric nephrologists, um, the definition of primary endpoints for clinical trials is challenging, um, and we're trying to um, approach this issue with international registry uh, studies to first characterize um, these cohorts better than, previous, than it could previously uh, be done. So with that, um, I want to thank um, the people who did the work, people in the in the lab, um, or who did the, the registry studies. Um, Katri Burgmeier did a lot uh, on this. Um, obviously, the people who gave the money, uh, funding sources, and um, I'll be happy to to discuss questions afterwards. Um, I think we we now said as this was also. Um, uh, suggested to be uh, a teaching a teaching course, we now add the, the multiple choice uh, questions straight away. So I, I quickly go on uh, with this and uh, start it. <clears throat> so uh, we start with the with the first question that should now um, show up um, on your computers. Um, and the first question is, um, in which of these uh, diseases uh, do you typically find um, enlarged kidneys? Is this ARPKD, ADPKD during its cause, I should say, nephronophthesis, um, none of the above, um, or A and B? So I'll give this another 10 seconds. And we'll close it now. So more than 80% of, um, of you said, OK, it's ARPKD and ADPKD. And uh, this is obviously, uh, this is the, the uh, answer that we were looking for. Nephronophthesis uh, shows normal sized or even small um, kidneys. I will go on with the next um, uh, question and we'll also launch it uh, on your uh, computers now. What about extrarenal manifestations? Um, in which of these uh, diseases uh, can you find them? Again, there may be um, uh, more than one uh, um, involved. It's ARPKD, ADPKD, nephronophthesis, HNF1 beta, or all of the above. I think I can I can close this one now because 100% were correct. Obviously, you you find it in in all of these uh, disorders. So a third third of the four questions um, goes into the same same direction. So cilia and cilia associated signaling. Um, occur in the, the following organs, um, kidney, liver, retina, none of the above or all of the above. <laughs> and again, I can close this quickly because 98% um, were, were correct. And this is um, actually the last um, question that we're now uh, looking at. So established prenatal risk factors for dialysis dependency in the first year of life in ARPKD now include um, oligohydramnios, enlarged kidneys and renal cysts, gender, age of parents, pulmonary hypoplasia, or early diagnosis. 
and again, it's almost 100% um, that shows the right answer A. Close this now. And with that, um, I've come to an end, and um, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'd be happy to discuss questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Max, uh, for this very nice overview. I think we've learned a lot, and uh, uh, you summarized very nicely the, the current thinking about these diseases. So I have my screen open here, and I'm waiting for your questions. Um, I think we have an extra 10 minutes, um, and I'll be happy to forward your questions to, um, to, to Max. So um, please don't hesitate. Uh, uh, right now, my dashboard is, um, is empty. Um, so um, please don't hesitate. But maybe uh, while we're waiting for some questions, uh, um, uh, Max, um, maybe I, I will start with um, asking you um, this question, which uh, uh, comes quite frequently um, about the criteria for diagnosis of ADPKD. So, the pay criteria, um, the pay criteria uh, starts from age fifteen. Right. Um, can you? Can you? Can you? Uh, can you make a comment on how we should go uh, uh, in, how should we make the diagnosis in, in children that are younger than 15? Um, right. what, what is a, a, a relatively convincing uh, situation where you can, where you can make the diagnosis without the genetics? Right. So, um... As, as you pointed out, this is this is an important uh, lack of knowledge that the data has not been validated for uh, children below the age of 16, and this is actually one of the one of the reasons why we have um, now set up this registry because we feel that you know we we need more um, observational based data um, uh, to to rely on. Um, in a patient uh, with a positive family history of ADPKD um, that is below the age of um, 16, I would actually consider even the presence of a single cyst on ultrasound uh, a very likely sign uh, of ADPKD. So um, there has been also, and this is also, I think, a very important point, uh, the um, uh, the recommendation to look at, at blood pressure. It was on one of the slides, but I didn't uh, talk about it specifically. So kids may already um, develop hypertension. Um, and it is important to point out that this is something that we can already during childhood and adolescence treat, and uh, that treating blood pressure um, has been shown to be helpful for these um, wow. uh, for ADPKD patients. Um, okay. So treat hypertension, obviously. So I, the, there is the recommendation of a KDGO um, meeting saying at the age of five years, think about doing a 24-hour blood pressure measurement, um, and then look what this is, um, what this looks like. Um, if this is uh, okay. this hypertension treated, if this is normal, repeated after two or three years. Okay, uh, Max, and, and while you were uh, answering my questions, uh, the questions have started coming in. The first one is from Franz Schaefer, uh, who is asking, would uh, Tolvaptan be expected to work in nephronoptesis? Ah, um, well, um, so Tolvaptan is a um, V2 receptor antagonist, um, and um, at least part of uh, its function may be um, that it affects intracellular uh, CAMP level. It has been shown that intracellular CAMP levels are elevated in PKD cells, both for ARPKD and ADPKD, um, but I'm, I don't think um, that it has been shown for nephronophthesis. And looking at the, the phenotype and um, the cellular biology, um, 
I would not expect um, that this is a, a, a drug that's going to work in, in nephronathesis. Okay, um, so we have a second question, and, and, and this is a reminder to us that um, ERCnet is, not, is, is actually, um, it's, it's, it's a consortium which includes also uh, adult nephrologists as well as uh, young nephrologists. Now, the question is a relatively broad, and I think uh, because we, we are getting more and more questions, maybe you can give uh, maybe a very, very quick answer to this um, broad question, which is asked by Dr. Fee, uh, who is asking, how do we treat patients with ADPKD in adulthood? Um, I think that if you just mention the, just I'm mention the lines of treatments, I yeah. think that uh, yeah. we can move on to the next question. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, as you as you say, this is a broad broad question. Um, what we have learned over the last years is that blood pressure control is very crucial. Um, you know, lower this um, uh, hypertension. Uh, Tolvaptan actually is um, a, a drug for patients with rapidly progressive um, ADPKD um, that is based mainly on, on MRI um, uh, findings. Um, then for, for families, it is very important to um, uh, understand that pain is a huge issue uh, in these patients. Um, so it may be helpful really to, um, you know, what we've done over here, what the adult nephrologist colleagues have done over here is set up a pain clinic for ADPKD patients, and then obviously treat chronic kidney disease. Okay, thank you. So some some aspects. Absolutely, absolutely. And so now we have a question, an interesting question from uh, Dr. Karvi Ng from Singapore. And um, she's asking, in case when the diagnosis is not clear, would you recommend performing MRI of the kidneys and the liver to better delineate the location of the cyst um, uh, so as to get the diagnosis? Right. Um, I I think we are talking about are we talking about children or adults? Um, so this is I guess this, children. I guess children. I think it's children. Yeah. Um, so because obviously for children um, you you may um, need anesthesia. So that's that's why I'm asking um, asking this. Mm, does MRI help? I think. Um, it is not the not the the key um, the key thing. I would do um, good ultrasound, and then uh, if you then end up with with a question, um, if you have the possibility to do high resolution ultrasound and get good pictures, and you will then end up with with a field um, that may be uh, responsible. So you 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 know you will most likely be able to. Um, point into the direction of PKD also. And then in some of these cases, uh, we would go for genetic diagnosis and a genetic diagnosis in these patients will include a panel um, of different PKD genes and seriopathy genes. Um, so if available um, for such a patient, a panel would now be um, a recommended um, approach. Mm -hmm. No, there's no question about it, but I think the question was, do you think MRI will add something to to better define the liver and the kidney cysts? Okay, I'm yeah, just I mean, trying to interpret the question. Right, right, uh, right. Obviously, we will all go for the genetics, but right. uh, will that add something? It, you know, it, it might give you a bit of, of additional ideas about the liver, but will it affect my diagnosis in a way that um, high resolution ultrasound has not done. I okay. don't really think so. Um, okay. Yeah. I think this was the question. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you for your answer. So, Joost uh, Shanstra is asking um, that so you indicated that the model for prediction uh, of renal replacement therapy uh, that's about. So, I'm, I'm reading his question because I'm, yeah. I'm not sure that. Um, 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 it's the understanding of what you said that is uh, here in, in, in question. Um, so 
um, as you indicated, the model for prediction of renal replacement, renal, uh, replacement therapy only detects one third of the cases in uh, the G uh, piece paper. Uh, what would be the way to follow the increased success of detection of early renal replacement therapy? All right, so that's the question so that maybe, I write. So. Right, right. So maybe I didn't um, I didn't point that out um, uh, correctly. Um, so the thing that we see is that. Um, with this model, if these patients had oligohydramnios, um, enlarged kidneys, and cystic kidneys, then um, the likelihood was 33.3% uh, to require um, renal replacement therapy in the first year of life. So that's what the uh, what, what the model um, is about. So what could be additional um, aspects that might be helpful. One aspect um, could be genetics, obviously, um, but I guess the issue uh, arises how quickly would you get an answer and um, how, how expensive uh, would it be? And um, at least currently, um, it, would, it might just take, take too long to help these, these families. Um, if there was a way, and you know, yours is asking the question. He's obviously an, an expert in this this field. Um, we we do not yet have a, a specific pattern um, of markers um, uh, um, you know that that you could uh, use for let's say proteomics or so um, okay. for okay. intrauterine diagnostics. Um, in in these uh, cases, that's something okay. that would we would benefit a lot from in the future. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm, I'm actually I'm moving on because we're receiving yeah. many questions, and and otherwise we will I, I'm, yeah. uh, we won't have the time to go through all of them. Um, could you comment on the anticipated kidney size yeah. um, in HNF1 beta disease? Yeah. And this is Dr. Uh, Malakasiotti who is asking the question. Right, that's a very important question. So HNF1 beta is very shows very variable uh, presentations. Um, HNF1 beta patients may um, show kidney sizes or, or a kidney pattern that um, uh, may look like ARPKD, um, but they can also show a Kakut-like um, uh, uh, phenotype. Um, uh, even with just a single kidney. So the size can be very variable um, in HNF1 beta patients. Would you say that usually it's smaller than three standard deviations in length? I know there is a paper showing this. Would you agree with that? Um, I must admit, I, I would need to look at that, that paper again. <laughs> Um, I, from my personal experience, I would say HNF1 beta is very variable. Okay, so Dr. Uh, Shumikina um, uh, is actually asking you a, a, a very specific question about a child that she's been advised um, um, on, and uh, it's a four-year-old child with a family history of ADPKD. That would be the grandfather and the mother. Um, and um, the, the, it also has uh, characteristic renal changes, and that includes a good differentiation of few cysts and a normal renal function. Uh, but the child has congenital hepatic fibrosis, which is histologically confirmed. Uh, so the genetic workup is uh, undergoing, is ongoing. Um, um, and the question is, do you think there could be such a combination of ADPKD and congenital hepatic fibrosis? Um, yeah, the, the answer is yes. Um, actually, we uh, within the um, uh, the courses of, of many studies going on, we've um, seen a lot of MRI uh, pictures of, of adults now that, um, and in some of these patients, um, the, the patterns um, that we see, this is, you know, you would now rather consider this a spectrum of disease and not a clear-cut border between um, 
uh, cystic liver disease and congenital hepatic fibrosis. So I could envision that uh, this could be could be possible. I assume that the grandfather was the father of the affected mother. In okay. That. Yeah. Okay. So now we have um, um, uh, questions from Dr. Sumatra Rao. And there's actually a few questions on the road, so I will read them to you all at once. So is there a minimum size for cyst to diagnose ADPKD in children? Um, no, I mean, uh, it's, a, it, it's a question of um, uh, how detectable. Uh, with, uh, without a family history, uh, that would be one question. The second one is, can one centimeter cyst in infants suggest ADPKD? And the other one is to diagnose rapidly progressing ADPKD in children. Can we take number of cysts as a criteria? Um, uh, uh, these are three questions on cysts. Right. Um, so um, there is no, no minimum uh, size uh, of a cyst. Um, I guess in that case there wasn't a, a family history so that's something that you you need to keep in mind um, that um, um, this wouldn't strongly point to to ADPKD um, then to diagnose rapidly progressing ADPKD um, actually there has been very nice um, and important work um, by Maria Irazabal from the Mayo Clinic um, and um, they have set up um, uh, a score, I didn't show it in this talk, but um, um, where, where you can actually um, from a single MRI um, have a feeling where, how rapidly progressive um, this uh, disease is. So it's more about total kidney volume in these cases rather than uh, cyst numbers. So total kidney volume is the thing that you would look at in this picture. Um, and then the third question, I don't remember which one was that. Uh, was that it, it was just whether one centimeter would be uh, one centimeter like cyst. Yeah, um, I guess I would would ask for um, we don't know don't know about the age, of, but the the first thing would be family history. Um, then look for hypertension, look at the the liver, um, and then um, okay. see what this points into the direction. And let me ask you to comment on this. Would you would you say that much more than the cyst, the appearance of a time of a second cyst would be a very strong indication yeah. of something yeah. of a polycystic kidney? Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Uh, Sinha uh, is asking you this question. We have a baby with unilateral polycystic kidney. The DMSA shows good function on both kidneys. Without genetic, is it possible to come to a diagnosis? Um, well, n no. I mean, this this could be. Um, there, there have been descriptions of ADPKD that were were unilateral. Um, this could be some sort of um, HNF1 beta uh, presentation. Um, I mean. Um, I, I guess that's that's what you can say, but there, um, I think you, you won't be able to, um, at this point, um, have a, a defined, you know, even molecular uh, diagnosis for this. Okay, so we have two final questions, and because it's already 5 p.m., um, um, at least in our time zone, uh, we, we need to close the webinar very soon, so I will ask you for a quick, quite quick answers. Um, so, Dr. Bez, uh, uh, Victor Bez, is asking that for ARPKD, um, when you make the diagnosis at 33 weeks um, uh, gestation, uh, with that, um, with that, uh, if I interpret well what he's writing, with that rule out the possibility of developing Um, which is the main sign of progression and prognosis, question mark. So I guess how, how late uh, uh, would the cysts have to develop before uh, you can rule out yeah. that they will not lead to oligoidramnus? Um, right. That would be 
I'm not sure I'm interpreting well the question, but I think this is the way I read it. Right. So in, in the JPEDS um, manuscript, we looked whether the age um, or the week of pregnancy uh, played a role um, as a, a independent factor, and uh, it did not. So we, we can't really say. Okay. And actually, he just wrote me back that that was the right interpretation of his okay. question. Okay. And then we have a, uh, the very last question uh, from, again, Dr. Raut. Um, can HACE inhibitors be used for proteinuria and decrease disease progression in large kidneys and ARPKD? Yes, actually, ACE inhibitors are, um, uh, you know, first first line choice for treating hypertension um, uh, in ARPKD. Uh, this is just based uh, on um, observations from experimental data, preclinical data, uh, and and expert opinion. But there, um, an activation of the renin angiotensin system has been described um, uh, in. Um, models of ARPKD, so we recommend um, uh, ACE inhibitors to treat. But, but would you say also but, proteinuria, uh, as this is a case of chronic kidney disease? But but would you say because this is the question, uh, is there evidence that this will decrease disease progression in ARPKD, not ADPKD? For yeah, for AR, uh, there is no uh, evidence that I would be aware of. No, for AD. Um, uh, they have been used. Okay. Well, uh, I think this comes, this brings to an end our webinar. Uh, again, Max, uh, thank you very much for this very nice uh, uh, overview of these complex diseases. And thank you all for um, attending. Um, I guess I'm supposed to announce the next webinar, um, but unfortunately, I don't have the information. I apologize for this. Uh, you will have it in your email. And again, thank you all for attending. Thank you very much and have a, uh, a good evening uh, for those of you who are in our time zone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.